Thank you everyone for joining us for Pitina Gapas talk. It's such a nice turnout. Um, I know some of you are here for class and I can see all my students who are here. Thank you for showing up. Um, and the students who've traveled from Smith, from Mount Holyoke, from UMass, it's quite exciting. I think that's what makes the Fife College experience uh, particularly exciting. Uh, February 14th, 2018 will also be a very remarkable day in African history. Two very different events have happened, but they have marked African history in a way that many of us will never forget. Uh, in South Africa today, many of you will know that Jacob Zuma, who was president for the last nine years, was asked to resign and resigned this afternoon at 4 p.m. Standard Eastern Time. African history has been known to be about dictators and big men that overstay their welcome in politics. But I think we enter a new era where African politics is changing and the conversation on democracy becomes more comprehensive and powerful. But I also think that we would be quite remiss if we did not take time to speak on one of the most important icons of African history, Zimbabwean history, and I'm afraid that my voice might fail me. The man that you see before you, Morgan Changrai, he passed on this afternoon. My generation, your generation, will know him as the bravest man in Zimbabwe who stood up and fought against the greatest dictatorship that we've seen in modern history. Morgan Changre, with nothing but his voice, spoke strongly and powerfully against Robert Mugabe's regime. There is a poetic justice in history that his life should end while Robert Mugabe carries on, but I think as he dies, his voice will carry on, and through him we begin to understand that Africans are not victims of their situations, but instead, when they rise up, they can change Africa. So today we get to celebrate his life, his strength, and I think I speak for many people who are my age when I say that we have him to thank for being able to believe in ourselves. So I ask you, to pause with me so that we can thank him for his great contribution. Thank you. On a lighter note, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> We're so lucky to have Petina Gapa joining us today. A few months ago, I was going back and forth with her, asking her to give me a few things. And suddenly a message popped up on my phone that say that, who is this person who is so wonderfully involved in Zimbabwean politics? I felt a little bit embarrassed to be asking her to concentrate on emails from Amherst when she had bigger things to take care of. <laughs> to date, Petina Gapa has written three books. Her first book, An Elegy of Easterly, a short story collection that she says is about what it has meant to be a Zimbabwean in recent and difficult times. Ilegi opened the world's eyes to the magnitude of the government's operation cleanup that left nearly one million people homeless. Through art, she made politics real. At a time when the HIV crisis was hard hitting hundreds and thousands of Africans across the continent, many in Zimbabwe lost access to vital medical treatment. The most affected were women and children. The Illage of Easterly was shortlisted for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, and it won the Guardian First Book Award in 2009. Her second book, a novel, which is a thrilling novel, The Book of Memory, is a fictional statement on the impris imprisonment of a woman with albinism on death row who is hoping for a re presidential reprieve. Her third book, Rotten Row, is a collection of short stories in modern day Zimbabwe. It is a fantastic exploration of life in a complex post-independent society. Her fourth book is the upcoming historical fiction 
on the adventures of the life of David Livingstone. We are so lucky that she writes this book just as Black Panther is opening and Zimbabwe is at the forefront. Her stories have made Africa and Zimbabwe real to many of us. She's also written for The New Yorker, for The Guardian. Her most recent story is aptly titled Mugabe and Me. If you've not read it, please do. Petina, thank you so much for accepting my invitation to come to Amherst College. You represent the very best of what we teach our students. You're hardworking. I don't know many people who've written four books in such a short time. So thank you so much for coming to inspire our students. Thank you. Wow, um, this this is amazing. Um, it's such a it's such a sad day for for Zimbabwe, and even even if you are not. Uh, in the MDC, which is the Movement for Democratic Change, um, it's difficult not to admire Morgan Changirai's life and his spirit. So thank you, Chipo, for, for honoring him in, 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 in such a moving and powerful way. You know, when I first walked into the room, there were, I think, 11 people. So I very enthusiastically went around shaking hands with everybody because I thought, you know, a nice small crowd is more forgiving. So if I, I thought, you know, I need to endear myself so that, you know, uh, if I mess up, which I'm bound to, you know, at least they can say, oh, at least she has a firm handshake. <laughs> this is my very first ever public lecture in the U.S. Um, so, Chipo, it is such an honor to be here. And so I want to start by saying thank you so much to the Department of Political Science at Amherst College for this very kind invitation. And I want to mention particularly Chipo and Kim and Teresa and everyone who worked so hard to bring me over. There were some really, I, I know Chipo had her heart in her hands. Um, there were some moments when I'm sure she was certain that I wasn't going to come, especially when I would send her emails like, uh, I'm traveling with the president in Davos. Um, I can't reply right now, you know, um, but it was, uh, it, it was a, a wonderful invitation and I, I knew that I had to do everything I could to make sure that I was here. As I said, I'm terribly nervous. This is my very first ever public speech in the US. Until yesterday, I thought I was going to be speaking at Amherst, but it turns out that I'm at Amherst, right? <laughs> and I'm told that if I'm to pass as one of you, as uh, someone from one of the prestigious five colleges, I have to drop the H from the name I haven't traveled much in the U.S. I, every time I come here, it's, it's always such a thrilling adventure. I haven't traveled much in the U.S., but through the gift of film, through the gift of literature, I feel a very strong pull, especially to this part of the world. Here in lovely New England, every Nathaniel Hawthorne and every John Irving novel that I've ever read seems to make perfect sense. And I hope to come back again and again to experience this lovely part of the country through all its different seasons. And I want to thank you, the audience, for your kind attendance at this lecture. There are many things I could have talked about. My interests are many and varied, and I'm curious about a lot of subjects. But I thought I would move towards the path of inspiration and tell you a little bit about my personal journey into writing and about writing in what I call the contested space of Zimbabwe. So it's a story that starts with the fulfillment of a lifelong ambition, a lifelong dream. And it is also a story about the power of failure. And it is a story about the difficult choices that come from deep introspection. Now, I'm always intrigued by, you know, these gender-blind, race-blind casting. You know, like, you know, Shakespeare will have a woman playing Hamlet or, you know, um, uh, a, a, a black person playing Julius Caesar and so on. So I think in the film of my life, I am going to be played by Michael Fassbender. <laughs> right, so there will be some gender-bending and race-bending casting right there. So in this film of my life, in which I am played by Michael Fassbender, the story starts 
over two frenetic weeks in August 2008. This was the year of the most violent and most contested election in Zimbabwean history. While my country was burning, I was achieving a different dream. In that August, eight publishers on three continents bought my first novel. But what was so phenomenal is that these publishers didn't actually buy a novel. They bought three chapters of a novel that was going to be called The Book of Memory. Three chapters and a synopsis. I received the news of each publishing offer with mounting incredulity. The London offer came you know, with a very dramatic deadline to my agent, let us know by the end of the day. The Italian offer came after an intense auction involving a number of publishers. This all happened in a week, and I could not believe what was happening to my life. And after the deals were concluded, and I signed where I should sign, and I responded to some very kind emails from editors in Amsterdam and Milan and Stockholm and Paris and Helsinki and God knows where, I found myself euphoric but also terrified. It was beyond wonderful, but I could not imagine what it was that they saw in my work because it had taken me 35 years to publish anything at all. I had wanted to be a writer for as long as I could remember. I'm sure you've heard of writers who will tell you that, uh, oh, um, I, I wanted to be a writer from before I could talk, you know, from the age of three, when I was a fetus in my mother's womb, I wanted to be a writer. Well, I wasn't quite that precocious, but I had written every year of my life since the age of 11, which is when I first understood that there was a conscious mind behind the books that I loved. And in that year, I wrote my first book. It was a sci-fi thriller called Return to Planet Earth, with an exclamation mark in the title. And I illustrated it myself because I used to draw. And it was a novel set in a future where mankind establishes a penal colony on the planet Mars. But the convicts plot to return to planet Earth, right? Um, but for many, many reasons, um, the primary one being that in my country, which was racially segregated Rhodesia before it became Zimbabwe in 1980, opportunities to get an education were largely determined by race and money. I was from a very, very poor family. My father was from a very poor family. My mother was from a slightly better off family, but both my parents were from rural Zimbabwe. So I was the first descendant of both my paternal and maternal grandparents to go to university. I mean, think of it. I mean, I, we've traced, we were doing this amazing family tree and we've traced back our ancestor not very far uh, because you know, in, in an unwritten culture, you can only ever trace three generations back. So we've traced, I think, up to maybe seven generations back to about the time of the French Revolution, so not too long ago. But of all those ancestors uh, and their descendants, I was the first in, in both lines to go to university. So it was an incredibly big deal for my family. So I ended up studying law. And I have no regrets at all about the path which took me to an illustrious international career in Geneva after having done postgraduate work um, in, in Cambridge and Austria because not only did I make my family immensely proud and I really do love my family, I also acted as a torchbearer for my younger brothers, for my sisters and cousins in the wider extended family. I also loved my field of international law and in my job I was working for something I believed in which is the attainment of social justice for developing countries. But still, I longed to be a published author. So I wrote for every year of my life. There's not a year since the age of 11 in which I have not written. But I was so crippled with self-doubt that beyond a closed circle of family and friends, nobody ever saw my work. And then I had a mini life crisis, as I call it, in 2006. And the words of a friend turned things around for me. Tired of my endless moaning, I want to be a writer, I want to be a writer, I want to be a writer. He said to me, well, 
you can either choose to be a writer or you can just be someone who talks about wanting to be a writer. So I chose to become a writer. And in the space of a year and a half, I wrote the stories that would become an elegy for Italy, my first book. And the curious thing about this book, it was not even the subject of all this excitement um, in, in the publishing deals I stuck in 2008. It was an afterthought. It was a, a little book of stories that could serve as a placeholder while everybody was waiting for me to finish the big novel. And it turned out to be the little book that could, as I call it. Now, one gloomy author at a festival told me, you know, he, he, his face fell. He asked what I had written, and I said a short story collection. And his face fell, and he said, you'll be lucky to sell 2,000 copies in your lifetime. <laughs> so this is the, this is the uh, what is generally viewed um, about, about short stories, that they don't have a great sell through um, reputation. But I was really surprised by my modest success. I got some really kind reviews, uniformly positive. I won a major literary prize, was a contention as a finalist in four other countries. And over the three following years, I was invited to more than 20 festivals. I mean, I went to Melbourne and Split, Los Angeles, Nairobi, Curaçao, Gothenburg. And the most incredible thing, I walked and talked with my bookshelf. You know, all my favorite writers were in front of me. Kazuo Ishiguro said, call me Ish, you know. Um, Nadim Aslam, Alexander War, Camilla Shamsi, Christopher Hope. I mean, these incredible, incredible writers. And actually, you know, Ngugi Watyonga actually talked to me like I was a writer and everything. <laughs> it was incredible. It was like... <laughs> um, and it was just the most wonderful thing. Um, I remember going to New York and bumping into Michael Ondaatje. I'm sure you know him. And you know, you open the door, and there's Michael Ondaatje with his white hair and his beaming smile. So I said, oh my god. And he said, just call me Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so it was absolutely wonderful. But even as I was enjoying this public success, I lived every day with what I considered private failure. Because away from all this excitement, my life was a churning maelstrom of self-doubt and guilt. Um, I used to be a Catholic, so in addition to my usual and permanent Catholic guilt about everything, uh, even when I go to the ATM to withdraw my own money, I feel like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. I was convinced that I had pulled off the most spectacular con in the history of publishing. I felt like an imposter. I felt like a fraud. Because this novel that had got everybody excited was simply not turning out to be the novel that I wanted to write. So those 35 years of doubt came back. <laughs> and how? I had always set my own standards, my internal standards of success. I mean, you're all very bright uh, young people in here, and I'm sure you do the same thing. You, you have an internal standard that you set yourself. Um, you, you don't compete with anyone. You don't want to beat anyone. You just want to measure up to a certain uh, level of success. And I had that in my legal studies, in my work life. But it didn't seem to quite work in a creative enterprise. Everything that I had previously written and not liked, I had torn up or deleted, started over, you know. But because of the contracts I had signed, I felt trapped. I couldn't just say, no, this is too bad to finish and start something else. And, you know, with the Italian money, I had bought some seriously fancy luggage, you know. <laughs> I had some very nice handbags, um, which, of course, made me feel even more guilty. Um, and I felt that I, I was held hostage to a book that I no longer wanted to write, I was stuck and I felt trapped. But in the middle of writing the novel, I took a leave of absence from my job in Geneva and I moved back to Zimbabwe for three years. I forgot about the novel. I started doing fun things like I led a project to renovate my childhood library, the Harare City Library. It was the place that formed me as a reader. And I, from there I had borrowed all the books that first fired my ambition to be a writer. And in the run-up to the election in 2013, I became passionately involved in public debates about the future direction of my country. And somehow, in all of this, I found that novel again, unexpectedly, without even looking for it. It just came to me. 
And so I started afresh, and I worked until I found the novel that I had first imagined. And by this time, everybody thought I'd given up on it. My agent was saying, oh, you know, we'll cancel the contracts, we'll have to see what we can do, don't worry about it. So back in Zimbabwe, I found that novel, the novel I had first imagined before there were book contracts, before there was glitz and glamour, fancy dinners, fancy luggage. And 37 drafts later, I got it right and I still found myself falling short. I really believe that it is the worst book I will ever write. I haven't read it since the 19th of June 2014, which was the day I handed it in. I handed in the manuscript. Um, I can't read it. It is too close to me. It is too, the sense of failure is too very strong. Uh, but I consider it my most important book because it's, it's the book that I had to finish to become a writer. And it's the book that taught me that it's okay to be afraid, it's okay to fail, and in fact, failure has its own kind of power. It's also the book that taught me the kind of writer that I am. The main reason that my modest, relatively modest success felt like a trap is because of something that I will call the burden of representation. And this is now getting deep into, our, into my topic. It took off a lot of unraveling, and picking, and packing, and therapy <laughs> to get at the heart of my unease. And it was with some relief that I d recognized that what had fired my imposter syndrome, what, I had, what had fired my sense of being a fraud, was that I simply did not recognize myself in the many reviews of my books and in the many comments about me, both within and outside Zimbabwe. I wanna tell you about my first interview. This is me. <laughs> this, is, this is basically my default uh, face with which I greet the world. It's like, wow, isn't life amazing? I get told that your first interview, first book, 2009, April 2009, your first book, is published and your first interview is on BBC World. 12 o'clock news, George freaking Alagaya. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. George Alagaya wants to interview me, prime time, daytime, about my book. I mean, I'm a Zimbabwean writer, nobody knows me. I'm a debut author. I've written a short story collection Remember that statistic. I'll be lucky to sell 2,000 books in my lifetime. Why was I being invited on BBC? But because I greet the world like this, I was like, oh, this is so amazing, this is awesome. This is, I assumed this was all wonderfully normal. But it was only when I sat in makeup that I understood what was going on. So there were the BBC sound chimes, lovely woman is doing my makeup, and George Alagaya is talking about bad things are happening in this part of the world, bad things are happening in part of the world. And at the top of the hour, we will be talking to Zimbabwean author Petina Gapa about life inside Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe. And on the screen, I'm seeing the police chasing people all over Harare. I'm seeing Mugabe making that fist of fury that he's famous for. And remember, just the previous year, my country had had this violent, violent election in which Morgan Changirai had been robbed of his victory. So on the news that day, a few months later, were scenes from that election, an election that had nothing at all to do with the book I had written. But this narrative came back again and again as I promoted my book. I was the plucky little author defying the Mugabe regime through fiction. I was even called the voice of Zimbabwe. And if I had really wanted to, oof, I could have written this narrative for all it was worth. I, I could have, I could have, you know, I could have, you know, sought ref refuge in this country or whatever. But it felt incredibly distasteful to me. It felt dishonest. It felt manipulative, and it felt untrue. Because all I had done was to write stories about ordinary, purely imaginary people set in a country I loved with a recognizable background. I had created fictional characters and I hoped I had used all the skill I possessed to breathe life into them. But because my country was in the news for all the wrong reasons, 
I had become the voice of Zimbabwe. There was a headline so absurd, it made me smile, and I've actually uh, framed it somewhere. It says, voice of Zimbabwe comes to Pretoria. <laughs> It was a very difficult time because on, on the surface, it's all wonderful success, you're everywhere, you're being promoted. But I felt that I was being resented by other writers and I was certainly resented by Mugabe supporters, particularly the, the journalists from the state media. And I was celebrated by opponents of Mugabe. In the contested space of Zimbabwe, there was no nuance. There was no gray area. There was only good and bad, depending on where you stood. And I was seen as having taken a side. No one had actually asked me at that point what my politics were. It was assumed from what I wrote. I was either a champion of democracy or a puppet of the West. I was a brave defier of Mugabe, or as one newspaper in Zimbabwe called me, today's Judas Iscariot. And this was the face. <laughs> I had become a polarizing figure. And then you can imagine what then happened when I transgressed the boundaries into which I was put. I really got it from all sides. So for instance, I wrote an article for The Guardian celebrating independence in 2010, I think it was, um, in the same way that you all celebrate the 4th of July even though your president is Donald Trump. I mean, you're not going to throw away centuries you know, of history and your independence simply because you have you know, the orange-toned one in the White House. You still celebrate your independence. So I said, I still celebrate the independence of Zimbabwe even though Mugabe has been our president since independence because there are many, many achievements of independence. And of course, I got slammed for it. I wrote an article in which I pointed out the rather obvious fact that as things stood without UN Security Council action, none of Mugabe's crimes could be tried at the International Court in The Hague, simply because of timing issues. I wrote a blog post in which I commented on Mugabe's celebrated and legendary sense of humor. A prominent UK academic, whom I won't name, responded to these by accusing me of being in bed with the government. So even things like that, you can't comment on Mugabe's humor without being accused of uh, taking the side of Mugabe. So you can imagine what happened when I wrote my first critical piece about the opposition party, the MDC. So in the contested space of Zimbabwe, I learned that there are no shades of gray. There is only black and white. What I also failed to understand was that not only to himself, but also to others, Mugabe was Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe was Mugabe. And with Mugabe, there could be no nuance. You revered him or you loathed him. Chipo very kindly put up one of my favorite pieces. Um, I wrote a lot during the last, uh, the last year, uh, during the transition in Zimbabwe. And one of the things I wrote was a sort of a political obituary for Mugabe called Mugabe and Me. And I talk about how he came into my life when I was a child through his voice on radio a radio station called, coincidentally, The Voice of Zimbabwe. <laughs> no, really, I'm not making this up. So he came to my, to, into, our, into our home. He was a guerrilla leader. I was about seven years old. This was in the late 70s uh, during the independence war. And so f he has been in my life all that time, and I've had a very complicated relationship with him. And I thought it was a powerful, nuanced piece about somebody I had once admired whom I no longer admired. Ooh. Are there any Nigerians here? Ooh. Apparently in Nigeria, they feed you Pan-Africanism with your mother's milk. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So to actually dare to criticize a hero of the Pan-African movement, I have never, you know, it, this article was read by almost a million people, I think, on the BBC website, and the angriest were the Nigerians and they had things to say. <laughs> Some people even, <laughs> even dug into my background to say, oh, you were educated in England, what do you know? <laughs> Again, in the contested space of Zimbabwe, 
Even for non-Zimbabweans, there are no shades of gray. Right, so this whole thing was a baptism of fire that taught me great humility, and it made me understand the temptations of not only occupying false positions, but also of taking on the burden of representation. Being an African writer, a Zimbabwean writer, it seemed to me, was not just about fulfilling a long-cherished ambition that I had held since the age of 11. It was about occupying and straddling spaces. I thought I wanted to be a writer, but I discovered that not only was the political personal in my case, but that if you were a black writer, an African writer, a female Zimbabwean writer, you were an unwitting and perhaps sometimes even an unwilling representative. You know who Cassius Clay is, right? I remember reading an assessment of Cassius Clay before he threw away his uh, Vietnam medal and changed his name to Muhammad Ali that said, I think it was in Life magazine, he was a credit to his race. A credit to his race. I remember thinking what a frightening burden that must have been to carry the whole burden of your entire race on your frail, flawed human shoulders. And it seems like such a positive thing to be a credit to your race, to be a credit to your people. It's positive only when it's about the good things. But it can also mean that anything negative will reflect negatively on the entire race. That is too big a burden for any one person to carry. I would go to festivals and be told by Zimbabweans and other Africans, oh, you've made us so proud. And it was lovely, but it was also crushing. I, I love the idea of Zimbabweans, of Africans as a family. But what would happen the day I didn't make them proud? I felt I could also never be judged for the quality of my work, for the merit of my writing, but for the themes that I addressed. And this now was the thing that drove me to therapy. A sneaking suspicion began to form in my mind that perhaps my book was not so much good as it was relevant. In fact, every time I was told that a class was studying my book, my heart sank. I wanted to be enjoyed. I didn't want to be endured. I didn't want to be the person who gave some undergraduate reason to be very angry. But I have learned after much introspection and much reflection that I consider myself to have three public identities. And these are the identities at the, at the heart of my writing. I am a lawyer, I am a writer, and I am a citizen. I have other private identities, multiple identities. I am a reader, I am the mother of a gorgeous son, I'm the daughter of my parents, I'm the best friends to some fabulous women, I've been an, a girlfriend to some really incredible men. Um, but it is of these three identities that I think of when I approach my country. And I finally come to instill these identities as being preoccupied with different questions. As a writer, I want to know what is truth. As a lawyer, I ask myself, what is the nature of justice? And as a citizen, I ask myself, what is reality? I've come to understand that these are lifelong questions that I may never be able to answer. There can never be one answer to any of them. No matter the temptation to be simplistic, to be reductionist, to be both easy and easily understood, it is simply not possible in the contested space of Zimbabwe. If I am to be a writer who is truthful in reflecting what I see, I cannot reduce my country to one thing, to one side, to one argument. If I am to be a lawyer, who is concerned about justice, I have to ask whose justice at what time. And if I'm a citizen who seeks in my work to reflect the reality of my country, I must ask myself, through whose prism do I reflect this reality? What it means to me as a writer is that I must surrender certainty. This is the hardest thing that I've ever had to do because I have very firm beliefs about certain things. But I've learned that I have to surrender certainty. 
I have to surrender platitudes. I have to surrender slogans. And I have to surrender the black and white and move squarely, comfortably in the gray spaces in between. And whatever the temptation, I must resist the burden of the past. I'm also moving further and further into the past, in part because the past is much easier to grapple with. Rhodesia, for instance, the predecessor country to Zimbabwe, Rhodesia was contested once, but it is no longer contested, or at least no longer contested in the same way. History has settled certain questions. We can look back and say, this was just, this was unjust, this was truthful, this was untruthful, this was reality. But in Zimbabwe, I am writing into a fluid space. I am writing in moving history. And the complexity of this contested space means that even the people said to be perpetrators of injustice, the twisters of truth, have their genuine grievances. So let's take the contested question of land. It is true that there has been great mismanagement and corruption in the allocation of land in Zimbabwe, but it is also true that at independence there was great injustice in land ownership. Same thing with economic collapse of the country. Corruption is a factor, economic misgovernance is a factor, but it's also true that sanctions and other chilling measures have had a debilitating effect on ordinary lives. On almost every issue, it is possible to see shades of gray and not the start satisfaction of the black and white. And so this is the reason that I'm now moving in the gray spaces. My experience has been to prove the truth of the words of Nathaniel Hawthorne, a famous man of letters associated with the five colleges. I read the Scarlet Letter when I was, I think, 18 or so. And there's a wonderful line where he says, no man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be true. To me, the task of the novelist is a simple one. Politics aside, questions of justice aside, questions of reality and truth aside, it is about illuminating the chambers of the human heart. Edmund White said, a writer should concern himself with whatever absorbs his fancy, stirs his heart, and limbers his typewriter. I feel no obligation to deal with politics. I do feel a responsibility to society because of going into print. A writer has a duty to be good, not lousy, true, not false, lively, not dull, accurate, not full of error. He should tend to lift people up, not lower them down. This is what writing is for me. This is how I now negotiate the three identities that make me write about the intersection between truth, justice, and reality. I do not want to be right. I do not want to be a crusader. I do not want to be a champion. I do not want to be important. I do not want to be worthy. I do not want to be a sloganeer. I do not want to be a pamphleteer. I want to be read by all who enjoy good writing. I want people who read my work to say, this is good. Above all else, I want to be good. I want to be very, very good. Thank you. Thank you.